Carter, ambassador a hit. We keep it here. Is even as this is on the dome, a man of mass, I know. I was seeing a troll, a real man of all night, a hell, I was there ahead. Ryan McMahon told me a tale out of school. I'm sure the bit against him, but he didn't mind that. He was teaching, he was teaching the pub class about the senses, feeling, sight, you know, touch, touch, feeling. And he put a glass of water on the rostrum in front of him. And he said, no boys, what are we in here? And they said, the glass of water. And what sense did we use? And it, it, it just it, and is it a sight, sir? Down that glass of water, and he brought up two glasses. And he put two glasses of the water on the washroom or something. And he said to the lads, he said, we have two glasses of water this can. But he said, there is a difference. Into one, I have put some salt. Now, which sense do we use to find out on which one the salt is? And a shower of hand went up. A mountain of hand, the forest of hand went up. So uh, he, he, he pointed to one young man and he said, say what I said before, he said, sight, sir. And Brian said, look, he said. If you kept looking at those two glasses, he said, until doomsday, he said, you wouldn't know in which one the salt was. And then a very sad boy put his hand up at the end of the class. And Brian said, when Jim, what did it? He said, sir, he said, if you kept looking at those two glasses and keep doing the day, said, the water would evaporate out of the two glasses and the salt to be left at the bottom of one. <laughs> Brian McMahon was the first man I met when I came to the school. I came into the school on a bicycle. And there was a, a saying that time in the town that a stranger come in on a bicycle that you should be nice to him because he might end up as chairman of the Auburn Council. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't drink, smoke, play cards, go with women at bitten horses, or take an active interest in politics. So I had no designs on the chamber, on the council chamber. Brian had a, a lending library then, and I went there and I took out a book. And when he saw my name, he said, Eamon Kelly, didn't I hear that name called out nowhere in the other night? And sure enough, he did. Austin Clark had a poetry competition on the radio, and I entered a few verses <laughs> about teaching what work out in Duan, up in the gospel and FD. Well, it didn't win any prize, but like the Mongol at the dog show, I was highly commended. <laughs> 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 that fact, but that fact, you see, that, that, I, that, that I, I was, that, that, that there was a bit of ink somewhere, you know, it uh, gave Brian a handle on me, and we became, we became friends. And Brian then had uh, been, he started the drama group when he was director, and I was delighted when he asked me if I'd take part, if I'd become a member. Of course, he didn't ask me right away. Brian let the dust settle first before he asked me, he made sure because I was a subtle, good subtle character. But I did, and I had been in a play in Waterville, and that play ran for some time and then it transfers to the West End of Clarence Lee. Are you the same They're definitely there. I was I was in the stall when Brian had all his original successes. I was there when he started writing stories for the bell, and we used to look forward to the magazine each month and turn over the pages, you know, the off-white walk time pages of the bell. And I was there when he won his first award for a story called The Ring. I think the bones of the story was given to him by his wife, Kitty. And I was there when his first play was uh, presented in the Abbey Theatre, The Bugle and the Blood. and. Uh, I remember a whole lot of little people all went up to Dublin, and Timothy Pismash and Cotter panicked in the lift because it was his first time. When the lift moved, he panicked because it was his first time in the lift. <laughs> and I was there when he wrote, as Gary had mentioned, uh, I was born in the marketplace for the BBC 
when radio was a power in the land. And now because Brian was so taken up with all his extra writing, he didn't have time for directing in, and directing in the drama group. And because I had served an apprenticeship of a, a couple of years, and I learned more from him about the stage than I ever picked up as the words from the most professional of producers. He knew, he knew a whole lot about the basic fundamental things of the stage. And uh, because he was taken up now, I was, I was given the job of director. Sometimes I wore three hats. I was a director, an actor, and set designer. And we did plays, and we took them many plays, we took them to many festivals, and we won many prizes. I became a neighbor of Brian's because I was living across the street in Hotel Moran. And um, <laughs> when Brian would come home from school in the afternoon, he'd come down the street, he'd go into his own house, he'd have a meal. And every single afternoon, he went for a rest. All his life, he went for a rest. And I do the same thing. He picked that up for a man. He's a very good tonic, and I recommend it to anybody. Go for a rest in the afternoon to have the time. And I got into the habit of calling for him. The key was always in the door. The key was stolen now. The key was in every door of the street that day. The white ball went suddenly the key and going. There was a big alley turned the kitchen and the down. There was a cup of tea from the kitchen and white. And then, when he was ready, he was, uh, we'd go for a round of the square. And we'd go out into the street, but we didn't walk very far before we stopped, and we went into Dan Flamingo's bookshop. And we hollered me inside the counter, and he'd motion us into the, into the back kitchen, and we'd go in, and we'd sit down, and we'd sit down in the, in the back kitchen talking to Dan Flamingo, and Dan would recite for us again within the Ring of Sally's. Within the Ring of Sally's, I'll build a house of stone, a little house and white with lime and patched with sedge of yestertime and live me all alone within a ring of sallies where I was some time known. And Dan Flavner would blow a singer through the table and he would say it, as he always said, within the ring of sallies by Patrick Kelly, the old bit thing you wrote last week. <laughs> We would, we would talk about books. Dan was in love with books. And we would talk about politics and various things. And then we'd go out into the street. And walking down the street, I got to know the people of the store so quickly. So walking down the street was fine because they stopped to talk to everybody. He was the most gregarious man you ever met in all your life. And he had a word for everyone. And if the people were on, if there was an old person and the old person was known, we all but had an inquiry about the parcelists that had been seen out for a few days. And then we got on the corner and into Moss Scanlon's shop, which Gary had mentioned already. Moss Scanlon was a harness maker and he sat inside this big window and it was fascinating to see him putting the wax on the tread, waxing the tread. And then with the awl, he sewed with his leather onto the, onto the horse's collar and he might repair a straddle to make an ubrichin. He watched the world go by outside. And the stone is always interested in the worry. And more interested in his wife. <laughs> <laughs> the year is always caught for the stray water coming in the breeze. We thought of that. And if, 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 you don't, if, you, if you're not careful, you know, then build a nest and send that on listening ear. But then we go, we have, having, left, having left the ears, we go around the square do a round of the square. And as Brian went along, it was a habit of people at that time, people of Brian's generation, to, to draw to them a verse, to pluck the stems from the atmosphere as well. And he would recall places like London and Montreal and St. Kieran's City Fair. And as we walked along, it was like the famous school in, Greek, in Greece, you know, the a uh, peripatetic school. He was Aristotle and I was his pupil. And I learned from him. I learned more from him. And then coming towards the end of the time when I was going to stand in my mind, he was the person who changed my mind from it. He turned my nose into the wind, gave me a tap on the shoulder and said, hollering of star. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 then we, we came, we, we, we left, we walked from there into Willow Street and we're meeting people all the time. 
meet Bunny Dalton. Bunny Dalton was, uh, was uh, for the time, was a pope from the Bank of Ireland in the square. And before that, he'd been a, a temporary forceman of the country. And there was a woman passing in the door, and she saw him standing in the door, in the door of the bank, and she was curious. Most contemplative, as God blessed you, they're very curious. <laughs> she was curious as to what he was doing there, and she wanted to know what his duties were. And uh, the first point is that, Mammy said, you know the greyhound was the six percent? I do, she said, well, it is my job is walking there, or... <laughs> <laughs> there were the beats, there were the beats, beats not in the time of the late 1940s, and the waters went into the house of Wings and Mormon and washed the published children of the houses. And Bunny said to us from the heights of that flood, he said uh, that there was a man seen floating down the river in a bed, and then white company on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> our last, our last port of call was Bob Cotterson. Gary has spoken about Bob's. Bob's was the most intriguing place. And uh, Brian, because he wrote, of course, the printer shop was the place he'd be attracted to. And it, the printers, the printing press that Bob had, there was a big fat uh, metal cat in the top of it. And it was so old that a white from Channel Street said that it printed I N R I for the cross. That <laughs> <laughs> old. And what uh, what would keep what would keep the, the posters that he was doing the the first proof the first proof of the poster they'd be all kept until Brian would call at that particular time in the evening, and it, nothing went to price nothing was put to bed until Brian corrected the proof and he wouldn't trust anybody else. Bob also, as well as printed the posters, he printed the ballad that Gary spoke about. And there were, of course, there were Brian's ballads, and Brian wrote ballads about everything. He wrote ballads about the Kerry team when they played in New York, in the, in the polo grounds in New York, and he brought, wrote ballads about, the, about them when they played at home. You cannot beat the kingdom sweet and hot the hound of man. And he, the, the, his ballad about uh, the, the Lestore races, they came from Castell and they came from Sunni, and uh, I forget the kind of fellow who came to be G. <laughs> there were Dutchmen and Frenchmen, a Turk and a Pole, and it was more like Geneva than lovely list <laughs> But the, the strange thing about the ballads was that they were printed in different colors paper. And the reason for that was there was yellow paper and gray paper and blue paper and white. And um, the Tadling, the Tadling ballad singers, the Tadling, uh, the Tadlers themselves who stole the ballad, were unable to read or write. But if the song, the same song would be printed on the same colored paper. So if you ask for them for the shores of America, which is a very famous song at the time, the shores of America, if you ask for the songs, all they would take out the red one and give it to you, the blue one and give it to so, And uh, the, the, when we were doing the, the Honey Spike in the Abbey Theatre, the last bright last play that was done there. I was shocked to find that the the travelers in the scene in Pop Fair had were selling sheets sheets of ballads on the thing. Do you know what they had? Sheet music. They couldn't get over it. And I, I unfortunately I had in a drawer at home some of the ballads which Bob Corpusing gave to me. And I brought them in the next day, and I gave them to the prop men, and they were they were copied and zeroed, and they had they had they had, they had the real thing. But there was one place, one, one place that Brian didn't ever bring me because he couldn't bring me there because it come to the end, and that was the story house in the ground. And there was a house there where stories were told, and where some of the stories were so long that they'd come back the next night to hear it. But it would be the end of it. Thank you. Tommy O, I think, was the storyteller's name. I think he was blind. And when the wireless of the blind came in, he was giving he was giving a wireless, and it put going in the window sill, and that drew his audience away from him. And on that scene, and on the disc of the storyteller himself, Brian wrote one of his most wonderful short stories. That was the one called "The Good Dead and the Green Hill," and he told me one of the stories that he held in 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 that in that house. Brian said, look, 
as a great phrase that says, I give you the bonds of it. I give you the bonds of it, and you can bless it up to the same. Which I did. I know at the present crowd that's going to England, doing as well over as John Emmons, some rich shit. So the long time to see when he did a good job over, I had that no one like that, and everything else has gone away out of my head. Whatever it was, he was making kindly, and every halfpenny he spent it in himself, and a fine dad she put in a blue suit, a watch and chain, and a velour hat. He'd be prominent at every amusement, and there was this night he was at a dance, and he made up with a big swank, he one on himself, and a stead were out on the floor, and every sit. Fate's coming on to the end of the night, he put the question to her. Was there any chance of the convey? <laughs> and she didn't raise any objection, and away they went. And when they came to her father's house, he was insane to back the gate clear. And she said, no, she said, come on away in and meet the family. And she was right, because the ladies were dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> she went in with him, and, and she, get it, said, she went in with him, and her father turned out to be a law. Look at that. The bottle of whiskey was produced when it didn't have a door that have it. And I said, if you smack the hands all wrong, the, the young lady said to her father, I'm going to marry this young man. Will you quit your prophecy? And to the father, when everyone knows you can marry no one lord than an Eden, how do we know where he came out of? Likely as not, he was born in a tent, <laughs> hinting as a certain thing. Was I now so rich he getting very touchy in himself? <laughs> I never you know that my father had built a band more. <laughs> but he gave the check up on that, so the lot then the upstairs for his agent, and the agent came down, and the lot dispatched him over to Ivan to find out if I was such a man that they had a band more and to see how he was situated. <laughs> so, then after the, uh, the agent, after Tom was going around, a boy going around the country, said he came to the town and band more. But there was a long, boring, that's a cut of the lane where long boring, going up to a house, small house, no bigger than my own, no great scope in it, only a room in a kitchen. <laughs> and at the two sides of the boring up along, you had goats with only their heads and their beards and their horns up over the two faces up along. And the agent, being a man from the city, had never seen a goat before. He looked at them and said, You marry me? Not that bad. He went up into the into the yard, and an old man came to the door, and the agent says to him, "Are you the elder Van Moore? Who is the old man? There's no other one of that surname in the stone land. Want to bowl in?" So he went in, and when the old man found out that he was from England, he filled him up whatever he thought there was story. The old man talking away, and the agent and said in the corner, "Fit to split." And uh, Mrs. Ellen was there too. I mean, I think she was posting it all, and in no time at all, she had a fine supper up on the table for the agent. And below at the bottom of the kitchen, you had this contraption brewing. Well, for all the world, it was like as if you had two, two cranberry churns, two meat tanks, and there was a fire under one of them, and there was rolly, bowly pipe. <laughs> Boys from one to the other, and a nice little bit. to white and ham in bucket. <laughs> and every now and again, the old man would go down and bring up the full of a low salt but, and give it to the agent. And to the heel of the hunt, the agent was far Big bit He didn't know whether he was in heaven or in hell. Now, bedtime came, and where would they go to put him? They couldn't very well put him into number 10. <laughs> <laughs> so what did the old man do? On the board in the field and cut a bath of green rushes. And he brought in the green rushes and he spread them on the flag of the fire. And he says to the agent, boom, yourself down there. No, no. Okay. <laughs> so the agent did, and when he got up in the morning, the old man came in with a pipe and he threw all the green rushes out in the yard. And after the breakfast, the agent went up over to England. And when he landed over, the Lord said to him, Tell me, he said, is there such a man in Ireland as the Earl of Banmore? Or you can be sure there is his agent. And tell me, said the Lord, how is he situated? I tell you now, he said, that man here that is so powerful, he said, that he gets to his residence, I had to pass through my long rank of soldiers with each bit. And he's indeed so wealthy 
He has his own distillery. <laughs> and to give you a further instance of me, that the bed that I slept in last night, he said, will never be used again. He did for the store of Maran. <laughs> <laughs> What could the law say to that? What the guy would say to it? Reach him out of the lady and from that jail, he never did a hands tugging and more than a That is my thing. That was it's out there in the West Coast. And he decided to go and live in the Kerry Bursted. And he mentioned the facts to an awful publican. There must be very generous the publican in the West Coast because in Dublin, travelers and so the public goes as a result. And the, the publican said to him, if you want to go and live in the Kerry Bursted, you know, you'll have to think of a video edits for that. So he went to lunch with the schoolmaster who was chatting with him. And he let him the fear more, the basic things about Irish. And then when he thought he had a good, a fairly good knowledge of it, he got all his family into his Morting transport, where he used to sneak and need the side in the Morting transport. And he set out for the Dingle Bell to come and he was there for about a week, he went in for the door. And he had to go down to the post office. And the farm pulled out, and the man inside said to him, Father Danby. And he said, Dear Mother of the school, I guess the van. And he said, Toyota. I'm going now after this. There were these two poets. Maybe I should sit down. There were these two poets, and they used to go every year to the winter fair in Kinmair, where they'd buy two cows for the tobit. They like to be this hardened bees when the days are lengthening out into spring when they become frozen. And when they buy the two cows, they tie them out to the lamppost. And then the two poets would adjourn to the nearest public house where they spend the rest of the day and portion of the night exchanging verse, arguing, and insulting people they didn't like. <laughs> well, it's so happy that one night, on one fair day, that they bought two black cows. And when they came out, the all in course with perish were standing there all night and the two poets were finding water after all the drink. So when they ripped the two cars from the lamp post, they get the blood and circulation the two cars began to run off into the night. And the cows were so black and the night was so dark that they couldn't see them. And when they got out of the light of the town, you know, they had two ash plants for driving the cattle. And they were hitting each other as often the way. And that was the night they had out the road in gates, south gaps into fees, and breaking day in the morning, they were driving two animals out before them, not their own. <laughs> not their own. Two rangy bullocks from the Rocky Valley. And by the time they had spent, they had spent the rest of the time going around to the schools, advertising the fact that the cows had been missing. And by the time they recovered their own cows, they swore that they'd never again get into such a predicament. Well, things rested so, as the man said, Came the following fair day in the winter fair in Kinmare, and people were surprised. Yeah, but they were surprised to see the two poets. The two poets went after that inside in the public house, you know, and they went on it, Maginor. So they, 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 they were talking about it, <laughs> and poets like this, they knew there was something they said about him. So well, the, the, the one of them got up and he said, We don't give a sign in about darkness. Be it blacker than nature allows. <clears throat> We're prepared for this time, my buckos. We have purchased two handsome white coats. <laughs> 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 Did you know that, Nick? Thank you.